on the full armor of God, for when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. Ephesians six thirteen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Amen. Uh, John three fourteen through 17. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the begin beginning with God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him his life, and the life is the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Psalms 119, verse 89 to 96. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my afflictions. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil path in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for, your, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I gain understanding, therefore I hate every false way. With patience and love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. Amen. 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 Treat others the same way you treat treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Amen. I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. Amen. Praise God first and foremost. Um, for those of you who kind of understand how God works, and for those of you who may not understand, I'm just a man. I'm simple. I'm, I'm weak. I have my weaknesses just like all of you. Do not look to me like some savior or something like that. I'm, I'm just a weak man. God is the one who speaks, and God is the one who works in our lives. Um, as I uh, was praying, uh, the Lord showed me through the Holy Spirit that uh, there was a big tree right here in, in the middle, and it was somewhere where there was a hill, and it was green, and it was, it was beautiful, and there was a lot of people, and some people went to the tree, and some even climbed the tree and sat in the tree, and some were just around the tree, but many were just out on the hill, just around, and many of these people that were not next to the tree, some barriers started to come up, like walls, towards the horizon of the hill, and from really out of nowhere, just I slowly started to see this wave that got bigger and bigger and started to come over the hill, over the horizon. And the people who had these barriers kept doing their activities. They didn't know it was coming. But the people in the tree started to yell out to these people, hey, you know, look, something's coming to take you. Come to the tree because, you know, if you climb into the tree, you'll be fine. Now, the people that were around the tree... They moved out of the barriers and they could see that the wave was coming and they started to try to get to the tree. The water came and it started to get onto the people's feet and the people that were close to the tree were very lucky because two people from the tree that were at the bottom pulled them onto the tree and they were safe. 
But the people on the barriers, they had nothing, nothing they could do. They were swallowed by the wave, and many did not resist. Many were, were flooded under the waves. I, I, I look in my life, first and foremost, I know when God speaks, I must verify myself first. Do not think that my, my life is perfect and I'm a perfect person. I have many things I need to change, and I know, but I do my best to be holy just like God is holy. That's what the Bible tells us. So I encourage all of you. I don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know, but we know our God knows. We know our God is the one who holds us in his hand, and he's the one who prepares us before these things come. We must, uh, in our households, um, just cleanse ourselves of things maybe we put up before God that maybe take more time than you know what we give to God. We must tear these things down so that we may see God is in front of me. God is willing to spend time with me, and he wants me close to him. Lord, help us to do this. Amen. We're going to be talking about the Messiah this morning, about the Anointed One. And we're going to learn together from the Word of the Lord. Let's read from Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This is the Holman translation. You guys can read up there as well. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place, this is actually chapter 61, where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me, referring to himself, to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of his favor, of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for an amazing time in worship this morning. We want to thank you for the time that we had in community. And now we ask that you would prepare our hearts to hear your word. Your word is all that we desire this morning. Your goodness is proclaimed to us every day, and it's renewed, and we know that your love never fails us. Help us to have an open mind this morning and an open heart as we listen, and help us to take these words and to put them in a good place in our heart, that they may bring forth fruit for your glory and for your kingdom and for your gospel. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to remind you that here at Hosanna Christian Church, we start with worship, biblically. We read Psalm 18. Bianca, thank you for Psalm 18, for another psalm that encourages us to, per- to worship the Lord. We continued with 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where we have a time of community. And now it's the time for us to hear God's word. And all of this is for one specific purpose. There's a verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, that says that as they were together... And as they started to pray and worship the Lord, the Holy Spirit descended on that place, and the place was shaken. And that's what I want for Hosanna Christian Church. Not just today, not just next Sunday or last Sunday. This is what I want for all of us, is for us to truly understand that God is working and that his presence is real. It's very real. So as you listen to the word this morning and as you hear it, think about the prayer that we're going to have in about 25, 30 minutes time. That will be the culmination. It will be the climax of this morning's session or this morning service. It's the idea that came to us from the Lord because many of you know this. Growing up in the Romanian community, we had a certain way of doing things. I went back to Romania and I was at a, in a service in the village of Mairu and we had a wonderful time and it was very, very different than how we worship here. It's not bad, it's just different. And here at Hosanna Christian Church, as we continue to understand what God wants for us, We want to break things down to make it simpler so that all of us together, not just those who are here, but those who are outside, when they come in here, when they come into this house, when they come into the presence of God Almighty, that they will also be moved and touched. And that is what we have received from the Lord. So this morning, as Jason was prophesying, I also had something on my heart, and he said it at the very end, and I want to say this before we actually jump into the word this morning. At the, I've said this many times, but at the 100-year anniversary, back in October, there was a prophecy that we need as men, as fathers, as leaders, to fix 
and to repair the broken down altars in our homes. And we know this. I've talked about this many times. But what Jason said at the very end, I had a thought as soon as, as he was prophesying and speaking. I thought, what about the altars that are there that shouldn't be there? You know? Maybe somewhere in the corner, in the basement of our house, there's a little altar. And I think about Rachel. I hope I'm not getting this right. She, or getting this wrong. She had her own little zay, her own little gods that she prayed to. God was working in her family and she still had this place where she went by herself. And I'm not saying that for the women this morning or for the ladies. I'm saying that for us as men. If there's an altar in our home that shouldn't be there, in Jesus' name, we need to take it down. And I'm talking to myself first this morning because I am so many times overwhelmed by this, uh, by this world and the society we live in. There's such a hunger and such a, a desire, an evil desire to consume and to have more. And maybe the altar that's in your home young father and young husband in the corner somewhere is just a, an altar to, to greed. Maybe it's an app on your phone that you need to delete. Maybe it's a, uh, a decision that you need to make. Maybe it's not even yours. Maybe it's your children's. Maybe your kids have started to worship and have built a small little altar to something that is ungodly and foreign. We have to be very careful. And I, speaking to myself first, have to be very careful. Because if there's something there, we can't expect God to work in a true and wonderful way. Because as was prophesied and as we read and as we heard this week as well on Friday, as we were praying here, we meet at 7 o'clock this month on Friday to pray as we get ready for a good Friday and Easter and also Palm Sunday. We heard that God is asking something of us. And if he's asking something of us, we need to pay attention and it's very easy not to pay attention. It's very easy to say, you know what, I'm busy. I've got a call. I've got to go record something. I have to uh, make dinner. I've got to do something else. But if God is tugging on your heart this morning, and I want to tell you something that he's really tugging on my heart this morning. But if he's tugging on your heart this morning, pay attention and make a mental note. Close your eyes and say, Heavenly Father, what you've put for me in my heart, don't let me forget it. And let me continue to work on it as we continue tonight and this afternoon and tomorrow, if Lord willing, if we have another day. I just wanted to say that at the beginning before we start because many times we have a plan in our lives. We have a plan for the service. We have a plan for the week. We have a plan for the concert that Lord willing will be on May 31st, March 31st, Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We will all be at Calvary Christian Church. But many times God says, you know what? I'm going to do something else. In Isaiah, he prophesies and he says that I'm doing a new thing. The problem is, is that we don't perceive that. That's what the Bible says. Can you not see it? Do you not know it? I'm doing a new thing that I will make waters in the desert. That's something that's impossible. God does the impossible. In Job chapter 33, I almost always reference this verse. It says that God speaks to us in many different ways. He works in one way. He works in another. But we don't understand. We don't perceive it. God is speaking to us and, okay, what do you mean by this? Or we don't even understand it. And that's why we need to have an open heart. And that's why we need to pray more. We need to, uh, we need to fast more. We need to get closer to him. Husband and wife, we need to get closer together. I was so happy this week, and I'm not saying this to brag on my wife, but she was fasting on Monday, or on, was it Monday or Friday? On Friday. And she told me in the morning, I was like, are you going to have your coffee? She's like, no, I'm fasting today. And I said, I'm going to fast with you. I'm going to fast with you. I had something planned today, but I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to fast with you because it's awful out there. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to talk about it today. It's really bad out there. And for those of us that have children and grandchildren, you know that they're being lassoed up by the evil one, just trying to get them, fishing and trying to hook them. And if we're indifferent... And if we allow altars in our homes that should not be there, we shouldn't be surprised 
when God is not working here, when he's not working in my heart, and when he's not working out in society. That's all I'm going to say this morning. I hope you can take that. I don't want to be mean or direct this morning, but I think that's something that we all need to hear. So it's time for us to open our hearts and to open our minds. I left this slide in because I love this slide. It's so easy to listen to a sermon. For those of you that have Sirius XM or even Spotify or even YouTube, whatever you're doing, you listen to a sermon and you just hear it and then you forget about it. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, Sora Viorica is here this morning. She's an amazing an esthetician. She does a great job for all the ladies and even some of the brothers in our church. But while she's there, while she's working and talking to people, she has Christian music in the background and has a sermon in the background so that just maybe hearing something, you know, Jesus loves you. He can forgive you. People that come in can hear that and they can be touched by that. So we need to open our hearts. If we just stand here or if we sit here, if we're thinking about, you know, the Lions game later today or I'm going to have, what should I have for lunch, Del Taco or Mediterranean, that's okay. I mean, we all do that. But when we're here and for the next 20, 30 minutes, let's really focus on God's word. Let's really focus and not just open up your mind. We understand with our mind, but we feel and we implement things in our life with our heart. Your mind can think many different things, but your heart is what drives the change. So if your heart is wicked, if our hearts are wicked, what's going to come out of our mouths and in our minds? That's what Jesus said. He's, I love the words of Jesus. He's so awesome. He's so amazing. He said that it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. And that was the Jews at the time and those who held the law and washed their hands in a ritual and tithed from their cumin and their mint. They didn't agree with that. But Jesus was speaking the truth. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. It's what comes out of here. So that's why we need to open our hearts and our minds and be ready for God's word. The next slide, please. Let's just, uh, if we can, go to the next slide. Before we start today, I also wanted to say a heartfelt thank you, not only to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but to every single one of you who are here this morning. Those of you who are watching online, Sister Teresa, God bless you, and Pastor Timothy, Director Teresa, the work that you're doing at Teresa Missions, those of you in the Philippines, those of you in Pakistan and India, Brother Sajad, and all of those of you in Romania and Ukraine that are watching us, God bless you. But I want to tell you something, and I want to encourage you. I met with a, a new friend this week, and he was asking me, "Let me, do you feel alone out there in the world when it comes to the gospel? And I said, yes, absolutely I do. Because for those of us who are here, and I wish this whole place to be filled, and we should have two or three services every Sunday morning, but for those of us who are here, you know what? We are workers together in the gospel field, in the harvest field. The song that we listen to in Romanian, it's called Oguarles and Gata de Recolta. Translated directly means that the fields are ready for the harvest. So thank you this morning for working alongside. Thank you for understanding that the, that the harvest is getting bigger, but the workers are actually fewer. I have five children, and I think, you know what, I wonder how many of them are going to be engineers or doctors or lawyers. And then I thought, well, I wonder how many of them are going to be missionaries. How many of them are going to be workers in the, in the gospel field, in the harvest field with me? And I don't expect them to do what I do. In fact, I don't want them to do that. My dad, when he was my age, was very busy. I find myself being more busy than him. And then I think of Isaac, and I don't want him to be more busy than me, but that's the way things go in life. The apple, as they say, doesn't fall far from the tree. But I do want to say thank you. Thank you for at least praying for the harvest. You may say, Lemmy, I don't speak English, I don't speak Spanish or German. And it's difficult. I went to Germany, I went to Switzerland, and they speak to you in German, and they look at you with a straight face, and you don't know how to answer. You answer in English. So I know it's not very easy to talk to somebody and say, hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, man, how was your day today? You having a good day? Can I buy that coffee for you? Do you have a minute? I just want to tell you how much God loves you. So many people are killing themselves nowadays. So many people are leaning on suicide. And, and if they only knew that there was a Savior out there that really cared for them. So let's continue to work together in the harvest field as we work and as we strive and as we sweat together. I'm going to go through a, through a couple of these slides. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to remind you, this month we are 
preaching and getting ready for Resurrection Sunday, for Easter Sunday. But this has been the theme for the past month, and hopefully we'll get back to it. Just keep this in the back of your mind. The journey from repentance to restoration and to redemption. But today we're going to talk about something different. It's more of a history lesson, a little bit of a history lesson. We know all of the verses, so this is nothing new for you. For those of you who are watching online or will see the sermon at a later date, some of this might be new for you, but for most of you here in church, it's not new. Today we're going to talk about the Messiah, prophecies about the one that is to come, and above all things, God's plan for us, for humanity. I am the eternal optimist. I always say this, even at work. If a project is going 99% bad, I'm very thankful and happy for the 1% that's going good, and I'm going to focus on that. We'll focus on the 99 too, but let's let's just be thankful for the 1% that's going good. The reason I say that is because my favorite verse in the Bible is John 3, 17, and we're going to get to that. But it's amazing if you actually read the Bible, if you actually read the Bible and pray, and then read the Bible and pray and seek God's face, it's amazing how the Bible does converge into the plan of redemption in Jesus, and of course, the salvation that we have through him, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that is to come. And I want to start this morning, or continue this morning, with what we read in Isaiah chapter 9. We know this verse, I'm not going to read, I apologize, there's many verses that I'm going to reference, I'm not going to read them for the sake of time, but we know these verses. But Isaiah chapter 9 says that, behold, the darkness that is over the land shall not always remain there. And I thought about the times in which Jesus was born, and I also thought way before that about God's plan of redemption for the Jews and for us. We are Gentiles. Peter, if you remember, when he went to visit Simon the Tanner and in the house of Simon, or near Simon the Tanner's house where he worked at Cornelius' house, he was amazed that God was working through us, through Gentiles. And he said, God, how can this be? And God opened the door for us that we would understand it. But so many of us today, outside of these four walls here, so many of us today are still living in this darkness, in this total darkness. And this darkness is a spiritual darkness. And you may say, Lemmy, tell me something that I don't know. Because we know that it's bad out there. It's really bad. The spiritual darkness has not only entered into Um, our places of work, our schools, but sometimes they've even entered into our places of worship and especially into our homes. And where there is spiritual darkness, there is no light and there is no light of Christ. And so many of us would rather run to the darkness than come to Jesus and to come to the light of Jesus. And that's what it says in the book of John and I never understood it. I grew up in a Christian household And it says in John chapter 1, I believe that men would rather run to the darkness and hide in the darkness because they love the darkness. It actually says that. That they love the darkness more than light because their evil deeds are exposed in the light of day or in the light of Christ, in the light of the gospel. So it's not anything surprising that there's such a spiritual darkness. And and when I say this, I'm not only referring to us here. God has given me a great job, and before COVID, I traveled the world. And I want to tell you that there is a lot of spiritual darkness all over the world. It's not just here. It's not just in the Middle East or in in the Philippines or in China especially or in India. It's all over. And this darkness only has one remedy, and we're going to talk about that. But I want to set the stage. I want you to understand that this darkness is a darkness. I don't know if this is biblical. I think it is. But it's a darkness that you can literally feel. Remember when the, Isra- excuse me, when the Egyptians were struck with the darkness for three days? Like you couldn't see, it says that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I mean, it has to be really dark for you not to be able to see your hand right here. It has to be very dark. And think about that in spiritual terms. Think about it in spiritual terms. A man hates his brother and kills his brother. A husband is completely unfaithful to his wife. Children hate their parents and parents abuse their children. That's normal nowadays these are things that happen all around us and the only resolution for that is is the gospel of jesus christ and we're going to hear about that that's it that's there's no other solution 
Here are some verses just to give you a little bit of an academic background. And I wanted to start with Luke chapter 4. We're going to get to that. Because there's a couple things that I didn't even know. So if I'm preaching wrong for the theologians out there, please forgive me. Or if I'm a little bit misguided, I don't think I am. But I just want to tell you what, what I found. These are some of the verses, and we know these verses very well, that prophesy about the coming of Jesus and about Jesus being the chosen one of God. Isaiah chapter 4, 7, verse 14, we know that verse that talks about the virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, refers to the ruler that will come out of Judah. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, according to the prophecy and according to Scripture. O Bethlehem, you are not the smallest in Judah, for out of you will come someone who will rule, someone who will be anointed, someone who will have dominion. And that person is Jesus. Chapter uh, number three, Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. I love this verse. And uh, Brother Teo, when we have our next Christmas concert, I want to sing the song, For unto us a child is given. Unto us a, ch a son is given. Unto us a child is born. That's the prophecy about Jesus. We know that. There's another prophecy. I didn't write it here, but it just came to mind from Isaiah chapter 11, that a root will grow out of Jesse. That's talking about Jesus. There's so many prophecies about Jesus, about the Messiah. And I'm not here to preach eschatology or the end of the world, but I love that prophecy because it says that he will slay the wicked with the breath of his mouth. It's very interesting. It's amazing how God works and how Jesus, when he comes to establish his kingdom, will rule. He will rule as king and ruler of this earth and of the new earth and of the, the new kingdom that will be created. But that's another Isaiah chapter 11, it's five or six verses. I'm not going to read it now, but it speaks about that. Isaiah 53, verse 5, Brother Chris and Brother Greg, as they preach the next couple Sundays, will speak specifically about this, about his suffering, that he will suffer for us. And it's very difficult for you, I think, and even for me as a true Christian, if we love the Lord, to read Isaiah chapter 53 without starting to praise the Lord and cry out to him and thank him for what Jesus did for us. We're going to learn about that more, but he suffered you can't even describe it in words. One of the verses or one section of the verses there that's just unbelievable to me. I mean, I believe it, but it's very difficult to understand is that it says that he was so bruised and so beaten that you literally had to turn your face away. It's like when you see a, I apologize for this example, but you see an animal or something that's been run over and completely destroyed. You don't even want to look at it. You don't even want to see it. That's, that's how bad he was beaten for your sin and my sin for my evil thoughts and for your evil things. It's amazing. Again, that's, we know that, that verse and also the beautiful verse in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which we will read on Palm Sunday as well. Behold that your king, your savior, behold that your Messiah is coming to you lowly and riding on the foal of a donkey, on a, a little baby donkey, a little colt. That's how Jesus entered in Jerusalem. And so many people were worshiping and praising him. And again, the Pharisees and those who did not understand, were gritting their teeth, grinding their teeth and telling them, be, just be quiet. But we will not be quiet because we love the Lord Jesus. Let's continue. Let's get into a little bit of, of teaching here. The word for the anointed one, and I, I'm not going to read this. I did some more study, some deep study, and it seems like the actual word of Mashiach or anointed one or someone being anointed is used many times in the Old Testament, 43 times or more. I don't know exactly, but this is what we're referring to here. So the word Messiah is derived from this word. And this is, again, the word that is used in the, the language and the culture in which Jesus grew up in, and other languages as well. But this is what it's referring to. And the reason why I read Luke chapter 4 at the beginning is because everything points to Jesus. And Jesus himself, this is what I love about Jesus. And again, I thank God for the Bible and his teaching and his word specifically. He proved to us who he was. He didn't have to, but he proved to us who he was. I remember as when we were praying that Jesus, as I was worshiping the Lord and saying that Jesus had the power to give his life and to take it back, he told his disciples that. He said, I have the power to lay my life down and to take it back. Again, there's no one that could ever claim or say that. 
So this is specifically about Jesus. But getting back to this point, the reason why I read that is because there are, and in the actual Talmud or the actual uh, uh, the law and the, the books of the Bible, the historical books of the Bible, this word is used for those who were anointed. But it's not referring specifically to Jesus. It's referring to a person that received that anointing. So again, just in the Old Testament, individuals such as kings and priests were anointed with oil as a sign of consecration or divine favor. And again, we talked about Jesus also being anointed. But I want to stop here for a minute and just explain to you the significance of the passage in Luke chapter 4. When the scroll was given to Jesus, and Jesus being God and understanding all things, he was also man. I think maybe he, I don't know if he was because I wasn't there, but maybe he was excited to read this passage. Maybe he was happy that he received the scroll because when he opened to Isaiah 61, and back then there were no chapters, okay? The, the book of Isaiah was not split up into chapters. It was just one scroll. So he opened the scroll that was given to him, and it was not, of course, given to him by accident. It was the will of God. But when he said that, when he said that this is written about me, he proved to them and to us and to everyone, to all of humanity and to all the entire universe, that he truly is the anointed one of God. So prophecies from prophets are very good, but in my book and how I read the Bible, the words of Jesus have the highest bearing and the highest standard. So when he says that about himself, you can believe that it's true. So that's why it's so important for, understand, to, for us to understand that he truly did come and was the one who was the anointed one of God. Uh, one other thing that I found very interesting, and if I'm wrong here, please let me know, but the word Messiah Actually, the word of Messiah is not actually written in the original Old Testament. So again, it's referring to the Mashiach, to the one that is to come. But the concept of the Messiah, the Savior in essence, is a significant part of the Bible. And it speaks about it in Daniel. I'm going to speak more about it for Isaiah. But it's also mentioned in Psalms. There are so many Psalms, so many beautiful Psalms that refer to Christ, refer to the power that Jesus would have in the future and that this still has, but while he was on earth. And it's so amazing for us to see how truly the whole Bible, the entire Bible, all of it is so connected. The words of Moses and the words of David and the words of Daniel and the words of Isaiah and the words of Jesus himself prove to us the things that we believe today. And for that, I say hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, because the word anointed can also mean Savior. And on that cross where Jesus bled and died for us, he showed the true love of God. And this is the gospel message. For all the children who are listening and the young people, for everyone that's listening online, the anointed or the word anointed can also mean Savior. And when it means Savior, it's not referring to anyone else except Jesus. I want to say that again. When it means Savior, it's not referring to anyone else except Jesus because he is our Lord and he is our Savior. And all of the examples in the Old Testament, and there's many more, all of the examples in the Old Testament point to him, are an example of Jesus to come as he came to us in this world. All of the examples. Moses said, and he testified, that there will be another that comes after me, and you should listen to him. And with Nathaniel also spoke about that in the New Testament. And they said to each other, the disciples said to each other, could it be him? Could it be the anointed one? Could it be the Messiah? Could Jesus be the one? And of course, we know that he was, but this is what they knew. This is what they understood. So all of these things, as we take them and as we learn them, we should put them into our heart and store them and truly understand that Jesus is Lord. Let's continue here. I'm going to end with this slide because we've got about 10 minutes and we need to pray. Jesus says that he was anointed to do what? To do what? To preach the gospel, to preach the gospel to the poor. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, praise God, hallelujah, he says, blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are those who receive what is given. At the beginning, I said, there's so many that reject the gospel message. Blessed are you if you understand it. There's no shame in being poor in spirit. We receive the gospel from him. And I'm going to go quickly here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Another word for favor is grace. It can be used in many places interchangeably. To do what and to whom? To proclaim to us, to proclaim to humanity that there's a plan, to proclaim to, to humanity that God from the beginning had a plan to send his son and the one that he was going to send was truly the Messiah. 
It's so amazing that in the Bible, it speaks about man's heart being wicked and deceitful. There are so many people that have claimed to be the Messiah. There are so many people that have a God complex, and they think, well, I read this, and they think it's about them. It's not about them. There have been so many false messiahs, and Jesus himself says that there will be false messiahs that come. Be careful. Be watchful. That's what Jesus said. So if we understand this truly, we'll know that we have to be careful, that we have to watch out for what's coming, just as we heard this morning. But to do what? To preach the gospel. And to whom? To those, to all of us who are poor in spirit. And we are all in need of a Savior. We all know this verse. I'm going to go through it quickly. And I'd like to end with the verse that I almost always end with. Last time that I preached, I said if I were to write a book about the gospel, it would start and end with John 3.17. But I want to make a correction to that. If I were to write a book about the gospel, it would start with John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It would start with the verse that everybody knows, or almost everybody knows, and then the entire gospel message and Paul and Peter and all the prophets, all of that would continue. And at the very end of it, it would end with this verse, John 3, 17. This would be the last breath, the last voice that is spoken because God's plan from the beginning was to save us through Jesus, through the Messiah. Hallelujah. That was his plan from the beginning because it says in John three seventeen that God did not send his son into the world to condemn us, to destroy us. He sent his son into the world to save us through him. That's so important. He sent his son into the world to save us through the Messiah, to save us through the anointed one. He sent his son into the world that we could have everlasting life if we would look unto Jesus. John 3, verse 14 and 15 talk about that, that bronze serpent that was raised up. Moses literally made a serpent. He cast a serpent and made a bronze serpent. And he put it up on a sprajina, on a pole, and he lifted it up. And just like that, that's another beautiful, amazing visual, in essence, a prophecy about Jesus, about the one who is to come that will save all of humanity. His heart is for us. His heart is for humanity, but so many of us push aside the grace of God. My prayer to you this morning is that you don't do that. For those of you who are listening, don't push aside the grace that God has given us. Receive the grace that God has given us and understand that you have a chance to find redemption through Jesus Christ with God. Let's all stand, please. As we get ready to pray, I want us to say thank you. And next time when I have some time to preach, I'll, I'll go through a couple more slides about what I spoke about last time. The Bible says, and Jesus is speaking specifically about John the Baptist as Elijah, that he came to restore and to prepare a way for Jesus, to prepare a way for the Messiah. My last point this morning, and we're going to talk about this again, is the fact that we ourselves as Christians can not only be a light in the world, but we can also prepare and hasten the coming of the Messiah as he has promised to us many times in his word, as he spoke to us in his word, as he promised to us through the other uh, writers of the New Testament, especially Paul and Peter, they all speak about this. And also in the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and says that he's coming again. He's ready to establish what he promised that he will establish. The question is, do I understand that? Do I care? Do I even want that? We need to check ourselves this morning and we should cry out first and foremost and say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice on Calvary. Thank you that we are restored and redeemed through him. Thank you for the resurrection power. And after that, thank him and say, thank you for the anointed one, the one that came to save, not to destroy. He could have sent Jesus to destroy. We know the story and we know the history of what happened in Egypt. When God did send the angel of destruction, Jesus could have came like that. But God said, no, I'm going to send my son so that whoever believes and whoever accepts him will be saved. So with that, let's, lay, let's lift up our hands. Let's close our eyes. And together, we're going to bring the sacrifice of thanks this evening. And then we'll give the microphone to the pastor. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this evening and this morning and last night and this morning, this afternoon. We want to give you all the glory and all the praise. Thank you for preparing the Messiah. Thank you for preparing the one who was anointed. Thank you for sending the anointed one to us, Lord.